uh, I want to first say, um, even though I'm uh, partially an organizer, that uh, we're now nearing the, the final day of, of this event, the school, and I think it's a wonderful thing. And it's, uh, I, I enjoy it very much. I think the location is amazing, and I, I'm really happy for that. And I'm really glad for the international speakers that, that came here and made it happen. And also for, for the initiatives in Technion. We have a couple of people organizing it, but I think Yossi is really the person that pushed us and other people into it. And behind, that's, and we have behind the scenes, and they, they're not, probably not here, Satania and Merav. Merav worked super hard on this. So now, uh, uh, I know, uh, something about the, the first slide. I, I guess some of you sitting here are saying, oh, oh finally, experiments. <laughs> and some of you are saying, oh, no. <laughs> um, but but as, uh, when we thought about this school originally, we actually had in mind originally an idea of trying to represent more of quantum science and technology, to put experiments as well. And I guess I was kind of the person in charge uh, of putting the, yeah, you'll see, it's funny, <laughs> of uh, bring, bringing more experimental, at least the speakers, so you can, st you saw the schedule, right? <laughs> I guess I, I completely failed. Uh, <laughs> and you know, I, I'm really happy for that. Um, I, I, th <laughs> I think that uh, it's just too broad. It is so broad, already talking about theory this week, um, that it is so broad that it's really mind-boggling. Um, so I, was, I, I tried to think what I want to, to present here. And you know, when you're a student, you're thinking what are the directions of research we can do in, a, in this field. We think typically very roughly on do we do theory in this wide area or do we do experiments? Uh, so I, I want to talk about something of a somewhat different flavor. I think that there is, a, there is this idea now that we, we learn this language of, I don't know how to call it. Actually, I, try, I asked a couple of people and no one gave me a consistent answer. Do we call it a, the theory of quantum information? Or maybe that's too narrow. Quantum processing, Yossi suggested. Or do we call it just the, the, the language of quantum science and technology? But you see all those things, right? It's the gates and the cluster states, the uh, stabilizers, um, th there are a lot of components here, and the way I, I what, what I want to promote today is that this language, if we take it back to a traditional field, it actually can help us find new ideas there. And what I, I've seen in my lab in the last uh, few years uh, is how we take problems that we solved, I don't know, just two years ago, and how we approach them with different language, with this language of quantum science and technology, and we can do it better faster, sometimes an entire paper in four lines. Um, and that means that there is something really deep here in, this, in the language that we're, we're studying in this area. And I, I told some students that asked me before what I'm going to talk about, that I feel like it's learning for the first time a, a Taylor expansion or a Fourier uh, transform. Those are things that it's, it's very hard to think about certain problems without them. Right? We cannot forget about Fourier transform when we look at waves. And in a sense, I feel like much of what we do in a operating writing things with gates and describing them now with, uh, with uh, stabilizers, uh, error correction codes, quantum error correction codes, is really changing how we think about old problems as well. So I want to take a few problems in light matter interactions. Um, and there are other examples out there, um, but I'll, I'll take three examples um, that where we really can describe them with this more modern language and how it helps us approach those problems. And one of them will be in electron microscopy. And the second, will be how we make quantum states of light and specifically try to create the GKP state that was mentioned here before. And the, th the third is how we can try to control the quantum state of a many-body system, a specifically symmetric, very highly symmetric system. It's called a superradiance process. How we can try to control it with uh, different tools. And to note where a different, more modern language is, is helpful, I, I feel like we will probably have a, a better talk to give in a year. Um, but I'll try this for the first time here. Um, and I'll start with a problem that I think is really uh, elegant and, and fundamental, and that's the most famous, most basic interaction we have in light matter interactions, the, the one in electrodynamics between the electron and the photon. Right? And that interaction is also what we have in this, in this kind of system in our lab. We have an electron microscope, and electrons fly down, and then we bring laser light and have them interact. Um, and now, I, 
I used this slide before, and I want to start with something very basic, almost high school physics. If we have an electron, and it comes to interact with some electromagnetic field, right? And now, you, you, let's say you know the initial energy, and you want to know what will be the final kinetic energy of this electron. How would you solve this? Right? What do you do to find this, the change in kinetic energy an electron gains or, or loses after interacting with some field? Right, what's the basic thing? High school physics? You could, but what's the equation? What's the theory? Right, momentum, Maxwell, actually there is, this is changing in time, so momentum conservation is a bit... What you would do in high school, and you have too much more advanced knowledge, is write the Lorentz force, right? And you just solve this differential equation, right? The dynamics of the electron. And then what you expect to get, right, from the E field and the B field acting on it, is some, if you have some initial energy distribution for the electron, and that it will just be shifted by some amount. Now, what we actually see in experiments, and I think that's the one thing that drew me into this field, is something like that. Okay, what, what do you see here in the electron energy distribution? Right? So first, it's, it's not just one value anymore. It's a very quantum, and it's also it's discrete. And the distance between those peaks is exactly the photon energy. So you feel that, like there is, okay, there is H bar, there is some, something quantum. Okay, and how do you describe that? Why, why is this happening? Because the Lorentz force will not do it. What you, you can do is write a Schrodinger equation, and a direct application of it will be Schrodinger equation, and you add the vector potential and the scalar potential to it in the standard way. If you solve this now partial differential equation, you will exactly get that. Now, when is it correct? Why is it correct? Behind the scenes, what's happening is that the electron is no longer a point particle. It's a wave function, it's, and it's longer than the cycle of the electromagnetic field. So you actually have to use Schrodinger equation there. Now, this is a, a fancy problem to try to solve, but here is something pretty cool about it. If you Describe this electron, note that it's quantized now, right? So let's call this one the initial energy. Let's call this state zero. And now we just number them. The states will be zero, one, two, three, four, and also minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four. Right, so there is infinite, there's a ladder, we call it, of energies. And then we'll have some operators. B dagger will be pushing us up, and B will be pushing us down. Right, this is not a harmonic oscillator. It's just going up and down <laughs> as much as you want. And now you can actually show that this entire superposition state will be exactly the solution of this exponent. If you take B and B dagger, you write this thing that looks a lot like a displacement operator, but it's, but it's not, you will get exactly the distribution here, the probabilities and what they are supposed to do. Okay, and that's a, a nice kind of glimpse of the kind of language we can build around the electron. And What's the, the uh, frequency of this field. And as long as it's relatively monochromatic, so the field that will be describing this E and B will be relatively single, single color, then you will have uh, this fixed omega. Okay, so now, uh, why do I bring this up? Because I, I want to put the electron we play with in the bigger family of the kind of elementary quantum systems we are used to thinking about. Because, you know, most of what we play with, the qubits, will be a two-level system, right? And that's the two-level system that we have quite a lot for... Uh, for so many systems, but another very famous problem uh, system in quantum physics will be the harmonic oscillator, for which we have the A dagger and A, right, and the, the bosonic system. Um, and in a sense, the free electron is, is a third type of system. It's a system that is described by a ladder, infinite to both sides, with commutation relations on those uh, operators that will be quite boring. But boring, but, but does quite a lot of things. Okay, and and that's, those are kind of three systems we can play with. And from uh, talking with, with Victor, um, I learned that this system is actually uh, famous in other places. It's also, maybe you should call it the quantum water from now, right? Um, so it, it's quite interesting that there is a third type of quantum system. And what I want to do in the next couple of slides is, is talk about the interactions between those systems. We can, we, can, we can draw this triangle and ask, what will be, for example, the, the most famous system that will describe the interaction between the two-level system and the harmonic oscillator. Maybe the most famous Hamiltonian of light metal interactions, and maybe some of you ran into it. Um, this is the Hamiltonian that has the energy of the two-level system, the energy of the photonic system, right, and the interaction between them, or the James Cummings model. 
right now it's interesting, but we can do uh, something quite similar with, with between now the harmonic oscillator and the electron. That will be the interaction between the electron and light in quantum electrodynamics. And that can be written in, in our, the experiment I just showed you, right, with the energy of that, the energy of the other one, and the interaction between them. So this system is relatively recent in when it was described. Actually, the first experiment to see this kind of feature I showed you is a nature paper from Caltech from 2009. The theory in a simpler form than this was written in 2010. Um, and it's interesting that the quantum theory of this, where the photon is also quantized, the first time it was actually written is a PLL paper by Ophel Phil from Tel Aviv University. So this is relatively recent. Right? Now, the third one is even more recent. And this is one of the goals we're now pursuing, finding a, a, a clean experiment that will be the interaction between the electron and a two-level system, a kind of a qubit and an electron when they interact. Right? This is the Hamiltonian we'll get, the energy of the qubit, the energy of the electron, and then the, the interaction you'll expect. Right? And that's actually even more recent. The first time it was mentioned, actually in the semi-classical theory, it was the Gover and Yariv, 2020. And then uh, this is our paper from 2021, and Shanuhi from Stanford, and a few, actually, by now probably 20 or 30 other papers talking about theory of this. Right? So then we can try to play with those systems. And I want to show you one example of what it, what it gives us when we write it this way. Because that system, and well, people still fight about how to call it, <laughs> but uh, this one is by now called PINEM, or Photon Induced Near Field Electron Microscopy, because the first person to run into this experiment was a microscopist, um, and basically coined a name that may not be relevant for how we think about it today. And here, this is called Free Electron Bound Electron Resonant Interaction, or FEBERI. Those are kind of acronyms that are so recent that who knows if they will survive five more years. Um, <laughs> so, Anyway, let, let's play with, with this system a, a little bit. And for this, I, I want to take kind, kind of one uh, bigger, uh, bigger picture view on the electron and what, what it does, okay? Because uh, I, I think there, it's quite interesting to think about this electron as a quantum element. And, I, and for this, I'll kind of uh, step back to present the microscope. I think what, what's really beautiful uh, about this system is that it's a system that acts in relativistic velocities, where C is, is important. And still, we look at age bar of single photons. And we put very strong laser fields in. We have pulses of 10 to the 13 photons. And still, we look at a change of a single photon on the energy. So that's, that's a scenario that's quite unique. And it allows us to do a bunch of interesting things. So here is kind of uh, my take of why electrons are fun to play with. Um, and this is probably the most experimental slide for, for today. Um, so what, what do we do with electrons? Is one of them, this is a, an experiment from a few years ago, um, we play on electrons as a way to generate radiation. It's actually maybe the most famous use of electrons. If you use a microwave oven in your kitchen, this is electron radiation. But there are qu quite a lot of scenarios like this. If you go to the dentist, you get an x-ray scan that will also be electron radiation. And we actually can create tunable radiation sources by right materials interacting with electrons. The other type of use of electrons will be for microscopy. If you saw the images of COVID, right, that will be an electron microscope taking those images. So for microscopy, the type of things we like to do is to uh, use electrons to image the shape that light gets when it's trapped in materials. So for example, here you have a, what is called a photonic crystal. And this is a, a scenario where light of certain angles and frequencies will be trapped in certain modes. And you can see how the smooth modes look by using the electrons to image them. We can similarly look at how light propagates. Um, this is when it's trapped in two-dimensional materials. And then you have things called polaritons. Those are hybrid modes of light and matter that will move inside the two-dimensional material, and you can make movies of those moving, in, moving through. Um, but now, maybe the most relevant for what I'll show you next is that when we uh, um, play with electrons, my kind of favorite play on them is not to try to use them for applications, but to act back on them. Can we shape the wave function of the electron? We saw this ladder. It's a very large Hilbert space. Can we control it universally? So for example, one goal is to shape this what we call the single electron wave packet. But for, for us, it's also now controlling the state in Hilbert space. And here is an example of what is, we call the free electron comb. It's an equal superposition of a large, very large number of energies of this electron. So it's the same electron. It's not just in zero, but it's in a kind of equal uh, taking of many, 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 many levels. Yeah, that's a pretty peculiar state that we can create. Um, so now, 
back to this triangle, I want to, to talk about this first. I want to show you how we can use the idea of an electron as a microscope and our ability to shape it, to control its wave function, to try to alter the way uh, that we can do microscopy. So he, here is an interesting uh, challenge. This is work led by Ron Ruimi and Alexei Golach, um, where, you know, if you think about an electron microscope in a typical situation, you will be using this for pictures like that. Right? And now, what, what, what would be the path, though, and this is a question that we're now pursuing, to try to not just see how matter looks, but try to see what's the quantum state inside. Uh, there, there are many systems, like, I don't know, quantum dots, where there will be an interesting quantum state inside a material. Often it's something living for a very short time. Could we then extract the quantum state, get more information about the material, not just see the shape, but actually see the state inside? Right? This is a challenge we wanted to, to pursue. And a way that we found to do it is if you shape the electron into some superposition state in advance, that electron that's now a superposition of multiple levels, when it will interact with the material, it will allow you to extract the quantum state in that material. So that's, that's the game that we propose to play. And now for this, what, what do we mean by a shaped electron? So the most useful way, and now I say this in retrospect because that paper didn't have that idea in mind, the most useful way to think about the electron is to try to make this electron into a, a qubit system. In much the same way as in error correction, people will encode into an harmonic oscillator a qubit. In a CAT code or a GKP code, we'll encode that qubit into an electron. Um, and this is actually an idea by, by two students from my group that so ask how do we really use an electron and encode a qubit in it when the gates will be the laser interactions and the free propagation of the electron itself. And they showed that you can actually create an exact mimicry of the uh, a block sphere. So here is a way to do it. If you take the electron as a superposition now of only the even levels, right? so equal superposition of even levels, we'll call this zero. While if we have an equal superposition of the odd levels, we'll call this one. Okay, that's a, a very uh, a weird use of this subspace. And now what happens to the operators on the electron once we do this? So for example, if you have a B dagger operator now, it will basically switch you between zero and one. Right? B will do exactly the same. So those become a sigma x on this, on this qubit. Right? And now um, how we see it in, in experiments, we'll actually look at the electron energy in the x-axis here. And then the electron energy will be a superposition of those peaks. So those will be the distributions. And then the zero and one will be exactly shifted in, in this way. Okay? Now here is an interesting thing. That those are exactly states we already know how to create. Right? Those are the comps that I mentioned before. Now, what's, what I want to do is show you what happens when a, an electron comb, or this electron qubit, is going to interact with a two-level system. And that's back to, to this game. So imagine that we have the interaction and the scattering matrix for this interaction. You'll have to believe me for this. But I take it from the Hamiltonian. will look something like that. This is a lot like a, a beam splitter. There are a lot of names to, to this thing. But um, you see the sigma of the atom and the B and B dagger of the electron. But we just said if we use an electron qubit for this interaction, right, we replace this with a sigma x, so we get something like that. Right? The B daggers are the sigma x of the electron now. And that, if you take an imaginary G, which is a special case we can choose, it will look something like that. So we actually have e to the i theta, sigma x on the atom, sigma x on the electron. Now some of you may recognize this. Uh, do you know what this is called? Anyone that has a, we just had a visitor in Technion who was a super famous for inventing that gate. This is a, that's a, that's a very mathematical name and, and correct, right? But this is also the Molmer Sorensen gate. And Molmer Sorensen, which is a, heavily used in ion traps, um, in, based, is a, allowing you to, for example, to create a, a bell state very easily. And there is a lot of math developed over the years for how we can use that operation with the right phases to basically not just create bell state, but create a C naught, and then you can do teleportation. So the scheme from here is, well, is rather trivial, right? We don't even need to think about the exact details of all the rest, because once we have that and we have teleportation, the idea is that we'll design the electron qubit interaction. So we teleport the state of the qubit on the electron, and then we read the electron. We got the state of the qubit. Right? And that's a valuable thing, for example, because the electron can come with extreme resolution. So we can choose individual qubits on nanometer scales. So that's basically a way to think now about microscopy, where we place on tele uh, teleportation as a way to extract the information, right? And I think it's, a, it's an interesting way to think about it. By the way, this paper didn't have any of this. 
we were thinking about it kind of brute force because we knew the theory. But in retrospect, this was, this was enough, <laughs> right? So that's one example for this kind of thing that I feel is, is, is nice to have when we think in the kind of more, modern language. Um, so now, uh, I want to shift to another example of where we can play with quantum information, the wider language. And this is a, the, the following challenge. And you have seen those images in Victor's, uh, in Victor's doc. And maybe you ran into them in a few other places. But the, the, there is an interesting goal behind the scene now, and this is to create those bosonic codes. And what we were looking at is asking ourselves how electron radiation can be used as a method to create those desired states. Because uh, I know maybe I'll mention a little bit on the history of this. It's right now very hard to make in the optical regime those GKP states that are super important for, for example, uh, measurement-based quantum computing and other, other schemes. Um, and uh, the proposal I, I'll, I'll show is that we can use our electron qubits and their interaction with photonic modes, this is a way to basically have light stored for a certain amount of time, to entangle between them and then by the correct post-selection to also create the desired state. So th this is a scheme that, we, um, that I want to show you and it's, uh, behind it are a couple of students from the group, uh, Rafael and Geffen primarily. Um, so maybe a broader word about um, about a technology here, there, there is a certain part, part of, of uh, researchers now and also companies trying to create quantum computing in the optical regime. And optical quantum computers is, is an interesting challenge, but it has a lot, some interesting advantages as well. The qubits themselves are stored in a, in a photon. It's a creature that's quite robust. So a large part of the computer can be made in room temperatures. Uh, it has this advantage of being able to, you can send it through fibers, you can connect different elements, different stations, and, and other reasons why we like them in the optical regime. Um, but the, how do we have, actually, how do we encode a qubit on light? Right, so right, we want a, a logical qubit, but that could be done either on the discrete, uh, what we call discrete variable, uh, or we can, it can be done on a continuous variable. This is the harmonic oscillator. There are uh, two famous companies by now playing on the two strategies. Um, in both cases, the actual light will be sent through silicon waveguides on chip. That's, uh, the vision is shared. But how to create the actual state if to encode it on single photons or encode it on a multiple photon state is a, is a big difference between the two. And for this, the, uh, the goal that goes for continuous variables, and that's the one I want to talk about in the next few slides, is finding ways to encode to do those encodings, uh, I think you had a, talks on this before, um, but it, I think the, the kind of the most famous by now is this GKP code. Um, and then it's an interesting uh, statement. What, what's the state of the art with experiments on GKP, on creating continuous variable GKP? So in the last few years, we have seen both in trapped ions and in circuit QED uh, significant experiments that were demonstrating the GKP state for the first time. But those are all uh, GKP states in the microwave regime. Uh, that is still far away from this dream of optical quantum computing. So far in the optical regime, no one managed to do it. Um, there are several proposals, and what we are proposing here is that the electrons can do something of that, of that type. And I, th I think that's, a, that's the regime I want to, to talk about. But now, what's the, why is it so hard in the optical regime? In, uh, one is, is nonlinearity. You want to have some kind of nonlinear interaction that allows you to shape it to the right form. And that is very hard to get in the optical regime. Um, there will be some people that will claim that it's, that for example, post-selection can replace that. So why don't we see it already? Xanadu will be, we had a proposal on this uh, direction. Um, but even post-selection on a large enough number of photons, I think number resolved is not a trivial thing. And what is the, is the microwave regime? Well, if you want to have a, a photo, like, let's say, imagine this computer on chip, a bunch of waveguides that will be small enough to carry light. So the microwave regime will not be on that scale. You want it to be at room temperature, right? That's one, another thing. You want to potentially send it through fibers to connect it to another quantum computer. All of those things, if you have a photon that is in the optical regime, its energy is much bigger than, than KT. Right, and the room, the room temperature noise. Well, if you do it in the microwave regime, you'll need to cool everything down, right? So that's uh, that, that one thing or where room temperature is relative to 
the optical photon energy or to the microwave photon energy is, is, the, enti is the entire game. But the advantage of uh, all of activity operators, I mean, uh, there are some advantages that are still remain uh, if we use, uh, uh, use the as application under the microwave regime. Like, so you're asking? I mean, that, uh, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, it's, is uh, to have the ability to operate about uh, over two remote qubits. Uh, it's the same cost um, over two uh, joint qubits. So, yeah. uh, so you're asking where? Uh, so you're asking where will? Um, because they have the money to pull the Yeah. Uh, where will be the? Okay. So will we benefit from using a continuous variable GKP like states mm -hmm. in the microwave regime? Yeah relative to the discrete variable approach. So some companies are trying this. Alice and Bob, I think it might be the most famous. Amazon were trying something like this before. It is potentially valuable also there. The Yale group, the, the Vorek group, is, is publishing on this constantly and super high impact thing. If you check uh, the two leading Israeli groups in Circus QED, this is uh, Shai and Serge in Technion and Weizmann will both be playing on the Circus QED in the continuous variable regime. So uh, there are some people trying this, yes. And I think it's, it's an interesting, it's a beautiful regime to, to work in. Um, so now, according to time, I'll see if I make a, if we want to make it on time for the stargazing. Maybe I'll, I'll skip those few steps, because I, th I think there is one thing surprising that I'll just say briefly, which you want to ask yourself, well, well my microwave oven, <laughs> what is the actual state of light that is created from the microwave oven, right? It's creating microwave, but are those, is this microwave, you know, it's some, some state in the harmonic oscillator, which means a superposition of many levels in this harmonic oscillator. Right? But what is it? What is that state, actually? What is the electron creating when it's radiating? Anyone has a, has a guess, actually? Right, we, we call them coherent states because those are supposed to be the, uh, the states of light that are classical. And it's actually not so simple. <laughs> If you actually try to follow the theory of, you know, this is all like famous classical experiments on electron radiation, um, and people expect them to be all coherent states, classical light. If you follow the theory carefully, in the first place we, we saw this, this is with Aviv Carnielli, the short student with Tel Aviv University who's going to Stanford soon. Um, we saw that electrons actually become entangled with the radiation they emit. And it's not so trivial to get classical light from an electron. And that's, that's an interesting game. Uh, but it will be worth a, a, different, uh, a different talk. I'll, I'll just say briefly that when an electron radiates, it changes its energy. So it knows how many photons it created. Right? So you will expect the superposition to be something that has the electron has knowledge about the number of photons. That means it cannot be really a coherent state. To create a coherent state with the electron, you need to modify it in some way. And why would that happen is, is an interesting game. For example, that, that electron, the comb electron or the qubit electron, is a, is a better shape. Because it will be, when you shift it, you will actually find that that electron remains the same. It's invariant under sending out photons. That means that this electron is not entangled with the photons it emitted. It doesn't know how many photons it emitted. So by changing the wave function of the electron, we actually change how it entangles with light. And that is the, the key to what we are proposing. Because we, we saw that you can use the electron qubit as a way to manipulate the light it will be emitting. So here is a proposal. You shape the electron with a bunch of laser interactions into this electron qubit. You then let it interact with some photonic structure where it, it will emit light into. And then what you get at the end is the ability to post select the electron and to keep some state of light that will remain there. And the simplest interaction will already create a cat state if you have an electron qubit to start with. And actually, slightly different electrons will create four-legged cat states and other things. Why is, why is that? So I want to try to explain that now with, again, the same language I played with before. Even though, again, it's not how we did it originally, but, well, now it's close enough. So if the electron-light interaction will look something like that. This is the creation and annihilation operators of the photon, and the up and down in the ladder of the electron. Um, and again, the electron qubit means we change it to sigma f. And that leaves us with a state with this kind of creature. I don't know if anyone here recognizes that thing. Um, Right, state dependent displacement or conditional displacement. Actually, the, this one with the sigma z here 
is what we call a conditional displacement. Um, and that is a, a very a famous gate in continuous variables. It's a desired one, because whenever it's created, and that happened in circuit QED and ion traps, from here, everything is trivial. The moment you see this, people that know the game with, with other groups, the path to create anything you like is, is obvious. And it's not so easy to see, <laughs> right, for those not used to it. But actually, this gate is a lot like the CNOT. You know that you have a CNOT, then you can do you know, universality and everything. So for con continuous variables, that's, that's an analog of CNOT. And actually, apply this on a zero photon state with a zero electron state, which is this even comp, and you see that you get a superposition of coherent states. And that superposition of coherent states is exactly a ket state with a zero electron and a ket odd, ket even ket odd with a, with a one electron. So by post-selecting on the electron, you will create one ket or the other. Right? That's, that's a, the, the obvious step. And you can imagine how would we make the four-legged ket state? Like what would be the method to make a four-legged in one shot, one electron interaction? Right? What would you need to do to make it this one instead? That, that's actually a tough riddle. But if, we, if, if we find the... But, but, but that one, uh, I kind of hope to generalize it and create even more interesting continuous variable states. If we visited Shiran's poster uh, in the poster session, so Shiran has a, a project going now on how we make an electron that is not a qubit but a qdit. A qdit with four levels will do a generalized version of this. And then by the right post selection, you will get the four legged cat state. But so we can generalize this concept and not necessarily make a conditional displacement, but something more general. Anyway, it's, it's worth remembering this, this thing, because it's the, kind of the cousin of the c -naught. And I think it's a very important state. What do you think for the question is yes? <laughs> uh, Would you think you have like a squared or a... Because, uh... So I didn't think about this, your question this way. You mean what other terms? Yes, so in order to get the problem like a cat state, you want to change a bit this uh, chemical, right? In order to create a cat state? In order to get this four legged cat state. Yes. You're saying, like, how would you change this operation? Yeah. This operation would give you just a two legged cat state. Yes. So, what I, what I said is if you don't put a sigma x here, so we do not use an electron qubit, but an electron qdit, right? An electron qdit will look something like that. So, it's a periodic state. But now we have four options for the electron energy superposition, right? And then electron qdit. Well, it's no longer a sigma x, but it's a generalization of it, right? And you will get a new conditional displacement with multiple con options for this conditional. And from there, what you will get if you apply the same operation is actually a superposition of four options for four-legged cats. And by post-selecting on the electron, you will be left with, with this, with this cat. Uh, maybe I went through this a bit fast, but I think it's, a, it's kind of a beautiful thing. You can catch Iran after for, uh, to hear more. Yeah? I think you were wondering if maybe you could have a higher order uh, A dagger and A operator. Some other but yeah, like something like a, a dagger square and other creatures there. So that, that would be also a potential way. It's, it's exactly the thing that's very hard to make, right? A dagger square will mean you have some interaction that's nonlinear, and that's so you can create squeezing, for example, and there are some ways to do it, but it's not, so, not simple. So that, that, that will be the, let's say, competitor method, but it's not simple to make. So now, once we have a conditional displacement, I can show you that there are basically schemes for how to make states like the GKP. There are schemes that were developed and demonstrated experimentally in other regimes. Now we have this conditional displacement in the optical regime. I think that's significant. Um, but here is an example of what happens when you apply them. So it's kind of a graphical example. You start with a vacuum state, so no light, and you send multiple electrons through. Each of them will be applying this conditional displacement. The first one will create, in this case, we chose smaller parameters, so it's a very small cat state or a kitten, and then we apply multiple more, and what you get is a squeeze state. Now you change the parameters of the interaction, and now not IGQ but a GQ, so it's kind of a different space for the electron light interaction, and what you get is, is uh, this, the creation of this desired, the GKP state. Okay, so that's a, a scheme that we can actually, well, we found it here, and then we saw that once we frame everything with a conditional displacement, we can basically explain this as an exact copy of the circuit QED approach. Um, here's something interesting about this regime. Uh, you can generalize it to hexagonal GKP states and many other creatures, um, but what would be the chance? We have to do post-selection here. Right, in every step. So what is actually the chance for us to successfully make 
uh, GKP state. We had here multiple interactions, right? Multiple electron, electrons. So what would you expect to have a success rate, success chance for, for this? Right? Because the first time you post-select, you have about 52% to make the catch you like. Kind of 50-50. Um, so it doesn't sound super promising. If we have, uh, I don't know, 15 more steps, it will be <laughs> 2 to the minus 15. It doesn't sound like a very, but, but something pretty beautiful, something beautiful happened. And that's, if you do that again, you'll find that the probability in each step for the electron to go to the right path, to, to go to the point where we want to post-select it, is, going, is getting higher and higher. So overall, the chance of this entire thing to, to happen, it doesn't go like 2 to the minus n, but like 1 over square root of n. And that's, that's a, an, an interesting uh, situation. Why, why is that? The state itself is exactly the eigenstate of the interaction between electron and light. Or how do we call it, again, in, a, in retrospect? This is, means, basically, that the electron interaction with light is a stabilizer for the GKP state. Right? And that, what now, when we know it, we can actually design that in, in other schemes and find better ways to create a GKP state as well. Um, and that, again, we kind of found it through <laughs> through, it, through trying, but in retrospect, there are ways to really build it in a, in a powerful way. So if you look at the probability of making a 10 dB squeeze GKP, this is the threshold uh, that was shown in recent papers for uh, fault tolerant quantum computing with GKP, you need about 15 electrons, and the chance for this will be uh, around the 10%. If you start with, uh, with the squeeze state already, which is done in many, many schemes, then you can actually get this with three electrons and with more than 30% probability. If you also use feed forward, like commonly done in I don't know, measurement based games, then you can raise this up to whatever number you like, to 100%. And that's done now in other proposals. So if I kind of summarize this with, with Gates, I would say this, this entire game, if you start with a squeeze state, is just applying a couple of conditional displacements, right, analogs of C0, with the right Hadamard. And you can create a GKP through those interactions. And that's in the next papers we write, and I can show you a brief of what Chiran showed in her poster. This is how we should de de derive those, those ideas, right? Starting from here. I think that's, that's an interesting concept. Um, so some, some ideas for where this goes next, you can catch Chiran for more on this, uh, is for example, you can use the electron nature as a flying qubit, not to interact with one cavity, but with two, and then create entanglements between two different cavities, so let's say between two different GKP states. Uh, you can take this forward and, and imagine something like a cluster state. So make a, a same electron interact with a sequence of different cavities, of different uh, GKP states, and then entangle between them. This is a, a project uh, recently submitted. Um, and now you see that we're already basically building all of this from the, from the gates forward. And that's, I think, is a really, it's a major change in how we think about electron physics in general. And there are ideas there about how to go for 2D cluster states, and it goes uh, further from there. Um, but now, since we don't have a lot of time, I want to show you just one, one more example, and, and, then, and then I conclude. And that's on the kind of last uh, side of the triangle. And that's no, no electrons, no free electrons in the game. It's the interaction between the two-level system and the quantum harmonic oscillator. Because even in those systems, we can use those ideas to design things. Um, we don't have to do this, those things with free electrons. So here is a, a project that is ongoing and, uh, in our group. This is led by Alexei, Ofek, and Geffen, um, where the idea here is to have a, a multi-level, a multi okay, a many-body system of emitters, so many emitters sitting together. When they are close enough, there are scenarios, really interesting scenarios, where they are undistinguishable. And then the, the entire quantum system can be described in a simpler way, as what is called a symmetric state. And those symmetric states are creating a process called superradiance, or Dicke superradiance. It's a process that is uh, known for tens of years, and in recent, in recent couple of years is shown experimentally in many systems. The, the idea here is basically, once we have this many-body emitter system inside a cavity, it will be emitting light from those emitters, first into the cavity and then outside. And the quantum state of light in this problem is, was not fully known, to actually give full description to it. But then what, the purpose why we go there is that we're trying to make quantum states of light of value. Let's say, can we make uh, the GKP states by using this kind of system? 
And what, what the value here is nonlinearity, as I mentioned before, the nonlinearity intrinsic to atoms and the interaction between them is much bigger. And then we can try to translate it to create quantum states of light that will not be possible to create otherwise outside. Okay, now here is an, then a fun game. If you start with all atoms excited, there is a generalized block sphere for that. So you're not an excited set, but there are many atoms excited. You will actually make something that looks a lot like a Fox state. And the Wigner function of a Fox state has those multiple rings. Right, so that one is still simple. But then can we, you know, not just get the Fox state from many atoms excited, but try to make something more fancy. Like can we make a cat state? So this is the state of the atom Wigner function, the atoms Wigner function that, is, that we need in order to make this cat state. Or if we want to make a multi-legged cat and other things, we can actually create all of that by shaping the atoms. Yes? Why the probability is only on the surface of the sphere and not inside? You don't have any coherence? So along the process of emitting, you have, because this will be entangled with the light into which you emit. But for at least for the problem we are describing here, we're assuming that the initial condition has something clean and then go out from there. So you're assuming a very high polarization and stuff? Or this is not, or not mass to OK, okay. just a, a step back. If you have the Wigner function of light, right? if it's a pure state, you can make those beautiful things. But the Wigner function can also describe states that are not pure. Yes. right? So first, on the block sphere, the Wigner function of a many-body system that are symmetric, that you, can, you can show that you can plot it on the block sphere. It's one thing that I didn't show, and it's interesting on its own. You can also make those Wigner functions for states that are not pure. Right? You, you are thinking about the inside of the Ross sphere because that's how we learn about you know, the, the one qubit and T1 and T2 that take you inside. Right? So this is not exactly the same because I'm plotting a Wigner function here. When you think about the inside, it's because you have one point on the sphere and you go somewhere. But I actually need to use the entire sphere to describe this system. So the Hilbert space is bigger. Right? So the analog is not, is not exactly the same. Right, so anyway, we can start from any Wigner function you, we like here, even if we prefer the pure ones, and then create this. The translation is, is worth describing more. But, uh, since we don't have a lot of time, I'll just show here is a goal and something we're working on these days. How do we design a set of interactions to create something that will look a bit like a GKP on the, on the block sphere so that it will be creating a GKP of light outside? Now, each of those steps is itself some kind of quantum gate. Right? And that's what we saw from the previous example is the right way to think about it. So we want to have a couple of interactions on the block sphere, on, on the atoms, physical ones that we can really implement, so we, and choose the right parameters, so it will take us in the right track in, into that thing. And the, then the, the last uh, concept that I'll, I'll show you today, this is a project by Neil Gutmann, who is also here somewhere in the audience, I think. <laughs> yeah, then you can ask you more about this, is, is exactly attacking this problem and now with a, an algorithmic approach. So we, we have just three interactions we are allowing, which is a rotation on the block sphere of this multi-level system, or squeezing operations, or, or basically two types of squeezing operations. Those S operators are the generalizations of sigma operators in two-level systems, but for, for a D-level system, which we have here. And then you're asking yourself, well, what will be the sequence of multiple gates applying one after the other, with the, and what parameters do we need to choose so we can create a desired state? And what, then this is super fresh, actually, um, trying to shoot for the highest possible fidelity for a good GKP state. So Neo managed to do this both for GKP and multi-legged cat states. So here is a kind of a, a movie of what happens once finding the right parameters. So you, you start with a vacuum state or all emitters in the ground state, right? and then start applying on them multiple operations, shake them and shape them, and eventually get to a state that will really create this, uh, this desired GKP. And this is um, a bit like machine learning projects. We get a bunch of parameters, and we actually have no clue what's the logic behind them in scenarios like this. And it is still a problem. What, in retrospect, was there a way to use those operations to make a more designed path to the goal? Um, the algorithmic one did a, a great job, but we don't know. For example, is it then universal? Can we create any state we like? Those are a bunch of interesting questions that are still open, um, but I'll not uh, go into them now. Um, it was a lot of fun, and I'm glad to take more questions. Thanks.